the first big hurdle that you have to face is what am I trying to protect and what do I already have in place and what are my gaps? Welcome to The Threat Show for the week of December 19th. This week's special guest is Todd Inskeep, CISO and cybersecurity executive with over 30 years of experience, who helps businesses balance their objectives with the need for protection against modern security threats. We discuss fractional CISOs, their rising prominence in the infosec space, and how they can be helpful to businesses of different sizes. The team also discusses four major threats you need to know about. Enjoy the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Threat Show. I'm Robert Wagner. I have my co-host, Darian Kindlin here. Chris Wilder is out on PTO, but will be rejoining us for the next episode. We also have our special guest this week, Todd Inskeep. Hi, Todd. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks. Todd's going to be talking to us during the show uh, a little bit about fractional CISOs, which I think is a quickly growing topic and and you know, career choice too, for that matter, and a little bit about that whole space. So thanks for coming on to help give our uh, viewers some advice, Todd. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. All right. Well, this is going to be our last show before the holiday break. Fortunately, Darian has wrapped up a whole bunch of a whole box of uh, threat chocolates for you to uh, to pick from. Yeah, it's like the variable uh, stocking stuffers for. for this week, <laughs> Hopefully, no lumps of coal. But some very interesting stuff going on this week. Yeah, it's uh, a mix of different vulnerabilities, different threat groups, ransomware, even a data wiper in the mix. <laughs> ah, so, great. The first one has to do with some uh, a Citrix zero day. Is that right? Yeah. So basically, you know, Citrix has announced a number of different vulnerabilities in the past related to their application proxy capabilities, as well as their gateway services. But what's interesting about this particular vulnerability is that the NSA has actually stepped in and said it's critical because APT5 is actually abusing this vulnerability right now. So if you're a Citrix shop and you're wondering, you know, hey, should we do any sort of -of out-of-band patching of this particular vulnerability? I would say emphatically, yes, it's (laughs) much needed. This one's really cool. I just want to jump in here, Darian. It highlights a change of the last couple of years where we're actually seeing NSA and the the U.S. government coming out and, and really talking attribution of an exploit, talking about who's using something, and really being open and transparent in, in a way that they really, government really hasn't done that in the past. And so it's a really welcome addition to our perception and understanding of threats to have the government, to have NSA come out and actually say, yes, this APT5 is actually exploiting it. It's really important. Uh, that's, that's just so refreshing. It, it's, it's a really important change in our environment. And that's a very interesting comment coming from you, Todd. So I I know that you used to work for the NSA, right? What do you think is bringing about that change within a three-letter agency? It's taken a long time, but the government has always been really interested in knowing what's going on. And it's constantly been asking for information from from the community at large and from commercial industry. And industry has been pushing back for years to say, well, you've got to tell us a little bit about what you know. And this kind of active recognition doesn't hit sources and methods, doesn't hit the the critical stuff that they want to protect, but it really helps highlight how important it is to protect this vulnerability because people are using it. And I think it's been a, a sea change from the current generation of leadership from Mm. Cyber Command and NSA and CISA that we're really starting to get them sharing more information with us in a way that we can use, but that doesn't doesn't impact the things they want to protect. I love that. And and, and I hope by having a a federal agency lead this, I hope that other agencies will also kind of pick up on this, right? All of us have been around so long that we remember things like the FBI coming to you and telling you that you've been breached, but then telling you they can't give you any of the details whatsoever because, yeah, right? So, uh, so, uh, understandably, if there's an investigation going on, sometimes they can't, but there is a certain level of sharing that I I think we can achieve in most of our federal agencies. This is is really useful, right? Because it's, it, it lets you know 
that there's something actively happening. It's a little bit of attribution without mm. trying to, to prove it or show it in a court of law or anything that, that gets too detailed. But it also lets you then make a better informed risk decision. And that's the most important part for business is I, I need to make good risk decisions. And the better information I have, the better decisions I can make. So it, right. it's, it's really critical. And it's um, it's a continuing trend towards the good of helping us all have a better picture of what's going on because we every every organization in in the community sees a little bit of the universe and so having a bigger picture of the universe right it's like having a few extra telescopes right. looking out there to see what's going on in the universe which is what the ISACs were supposed to all be about. And, and they do do some of this, but we need far more, I think, for that kind of sharing to happen. Yeah, the, the Cyber Threat Alliance got some of the big vendors together to start mm. sharing that information. The ISACs have done it within the, the silos of different industries. NSA coming out, CISA coming out, all being part of telling us more about what's going on in the universe just gives us a, a better information space to make decisions. Right. Now, Darian, since this is a zero day that's already being exploited in the wild, does that make it a negative day? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> All in the eye of the beholder, right? Yeah, right. But seriously, patch this one, especially before you leave on holiday break. This is an important one to take care of now. Remember that attackers do take advantage of the fact that you may have reduced staff during the holidays. So get this done right away. Absolutely. So next on our list is actually a vulnerability discovered by a cloud security company that does dark web monitoring. It actually got compromised. And in the course of getting compromised by a unknown threat group, they discovered a set of vulnerabilities within the Atlassian ecosystem. Ooh. Specifically, you know, this particular cybersecurity company was storing data within, you know, JIRA tickets, like a lot of uh, organizations do. <laughs> what, they dis what they discovered is that when someone logs in to their JIRA uh, server or, or cloud-hosted Atlassian products, upon login, the browser is essentially given a cookie you know, for subsequent access, and that cookie is valid for 30 days. Oh, they, When they tried to you know, trace back, hey, let's reset this user's 2FA credentials or disable the account. Guess what? The cookie that was issued to that user remains valid. So this is improper session handling by Atlassian, which is precisely how this particular threat actor got into the infrastructure hosted and run by CloudSeq, which affects a number of different organizations effectively. Session management is so much more important as we're opening up more applications through APIs, mm -hmm. as we're putting more applications out on the cloud, hosted in the cloud. We've been beating the drum for MFA for a long time now. We've got organizations doing MFA, and, and this is highlighting that managing MFA sessions becomes much more important. We we know we don't want to bug you for an for a, a multi-factor authentication every single time you you log on to a site. We want to maintain sessions and and do session management, but we've got to do session management very well. And this is highlighting both some of the shortfalls that you see in the way organizations may be setting up session management, shortfalls in penetration testing that don't look for session management in a robust way. Right. Given the way we're doing things now, and, and in some fundamental ways, it just highlights how important the uh, the Atlassian products are to our whole infrastructure. Right, e everything we're doing with agile development it feels like ties back to Atlassian or similar products. And this isn't going to be unique to Atlassian. We're going to see a lot more products that are doing poor session management. Yeah, from that standpoint, what's what's happening now is that those cloud SaaS products that don't do session management well, those credentials, those cookies effectively, will start making it their way to the dark web and being sold for access between different adversaries that are looking to get in. So it's no longer that they need to 
you know, compromise a user's account and get them to feed in their credentials directly. They can just buy, you know, pre-compromised cookies Mm -hmm. on the dark web to gain access to a number of popular Jira servers run by all these different big name Fortune 500 companies. That, that must be heck of a market because uh, even with a 30-day expiration, <clears throat> they're going to have to sell them and get used rather quickly. Yep. Uh, so if people are looking for a rule of thumb, your, your cookies should expire faster than your holiday cookies stale, right? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> But absolutely, uh, you know, Todd, Todd, you know, summed it up. Session management is important here. Atlassian certainly has one of the biggest footprints out there. But whatever you are using for uh, any sort of cloud-based uh, connectivity services, whatever, these things should expire quickly. I know that sometimes developers are going to complain, you know, that they have to refresh or something like that, but it's not that big of a deal. These can expire quicker without putting too much duress uh, on the people that are using them. Precisely. Next on our list is actually a new ransomware strain that was discovered within a number of open source packages, uh, specifically check marks and phylum. Security researchers found you know, a particular threat group has started to typo squat a number of popular uh, JavaScript and Python packages in order to lace what arguably would be a benign piece of open source software, which now has ransomware baked into it. So this kind of emphasizes, again, the need for proper traceability of the libraries and packages that your developers are using, because inadvertently, your your organization could become the victim of a larger ransomware operation if this goes unchecked. This one's also really fun because we saw a while back, and I think it was a year or two maybe, that you could compromise software packages by getting people to pull down a, a software library from the wrong source. Mm. And once we saw that, it was kind of inevitable that the bad guys would marry that with a standard typo squatting attack that we see all over the place in business email compromise situations. So just marrying the idea of, I'm gonna put some bad code out in a place that looks a lot like where the good code is supposed to be, it, it's inevitable and it's gonna continue. And it it really requires people to pay attention to the details. And in this situation, even the fonts that you use when you're looking at a URL, start to matter. You can hide, you know, a, an L201 in a font package. And, and all of a sudden, these typo squatting things become very visible or very invisible. And we're going to have to continue to really pay attention to where do we get our code from? And have we properly managed those, those S-bombs that we're starting to see really take off as a way of understanding our code libraries and our dependencies? And in fact, a lot of organizations might want to go the same way with packages as we have done with things like Microsoft updates, right? You don't, server admins don't go out to the web to get their package up, you know, their Microsoft (laughs) updates. You have a centralized repository. That repository gets checked. It gets downloaded by someone being very meticulous about where it's coming from. It would be way too easy to mistype Discord as Discord. And now all of a sudden you've got, you've got a bad package being downloaded without anybody noticing. Absolutely. Next on our list is actually a interesting new type of tool detected by an Iranian threat group targeting uh, EMEA and uh, Southeast Asia organizations, specifically the Iranian Agrius APT hacking group has deployed a new type of data wiper codenamed, I think, uh, Fantasy, as well Mm as Sandals. And with this combination of software, they've actually, you know, kind of perfected being able to completely wipe wholesale computer systems, at least an IT support services firm, a number of different uh, retailers, and an HR consulting company. You know, we've seen wipers before attributed to North Korea. This is probably a, a new step in, you know, the popularity of data wipers becoming more useful as potentially a hacktivist or political tool now being sponsored by, you know, potentially nation state threat groups. 
Yeah, no, data wipers are a real ouch. And, you know, we saw this with the, the Aramco attacks a few years ago. I think there's 30 or 40,000 computers that got hit. Saw it with NotPetya, where it was pretending to be ransomware, but it was really a, a effectively a data wiper. These have a huge impact on business, and it, it highlights the fact that you've got to be really thinking critically about how you do backups, how you're um, protecting those backups, how you're building resiliency into your organization, because the data wiping becomes so impactful to a business operation, right? And literally, you talk to some people about like what happened with their company when NotPetya hit, and it was, oh yeah, we couldn't even get to our incident response plan because it was only stored on a SharePoint site that got wiped by not Petcha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. Even though uh, this is a little bit, I mean, it, the mechanisms behind it are similar to those in ransomware. This is all about, I think you said it best, Todd, this is all about revenge in most cases, right? People want to do damage, not just get money from you. That highlights something I think Darian mentioned earlier, which is the MITRE ATT&CK framework is such a valuable tool for us because it highlights that there are different motivations. It's Even though we always say it's all about money, it's not always all about money. And so having those different kind of motivations articulated in, in ATT&CK lets us start to think about some of these different outcomes. And hey, this one's all about wiping the data. And that uh, that's a different effect from a traditional ransomware kind of service. There, there's another trend. I, I just saw another wiper show up in the threat feed this week that actually pretends to be ransomware. Right. So they'll they'll kill all your data and still ask you for money. And then when you pay, <laughs> yeah. And then when you pay the ransom, oops. You know, you're, you're not getting your data back anyway, which just, again, a secure, separate backup um, in a secured environment, separate from everything else you have, is so critical and so effective for these types of attacks. Encrypted, immutable backup it is the things that you have to be thinking about. And what's really interesting is that that's becoming kind of one of those key checklist security things that you see in cyber insurance forms. We're starting to see, I know this goes into a little bit different topic, but we're starting to see that cyber insurance become a de facto form of regulation by saying, if you're not doing immutable encrypted backups, you're not getting cyber insurance or your cyber insurance rates are a lot higher. And that's just driving the industry. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> Sometimes it, it, it takes just a, hey, you get a discount on your insurance if you do this to help justify the cost of getting backups when you didn't have them before or things like that. One of the things that I think becomes very important is that these ransomware events shouldn't be an existential crisis for a company. If you've got backups that you can restore from, then you can almost always bring a company back online. It, it may take some work, it may take some time, but it's not an existential crisis if you can if you can recover. Which, uh, you know, for, for listeners out there that haven't heard the term resilience before, it is probably a much more useful concept than being secure. Resilient yeah. is really where you want to be driving all of your efforts and, uh, and resources. We know events are going to happen. So the, the key becomes how quickly can I come back to normal operations after an event? How can I minimize the impact of that event? That's what resilience is about. It's about reducing how bad the, the issue is and quickly getting back to normal. Awesome. If you want to dive deeper into this week's trending threats, be sure to check out the interactive Fletch newsletter and Trending Threats app to see all the stories we talked about and more. Now, on to our special guest interview. Todd, uh, you've been in InfoSec for over 30 years now, right? It, it feels crazy to say that, but <laughs> yes. I, and I got really lucky. We all say we should praise our moms more. My mom suggested <laughs> when I was a freshman in college that I should go find a summer internship. And of course, this was 
a long time ago, as we've said. It, even summer internships weren't as big a thing then. Right. And I actually ended up working at the Naval Research Labs on cryptography as a summer job as a GS4 government employee. And I did that for three summers. And then that got me into NSA and that got me to Nations Bank just as it was about to become Bank of America. And, and it's led to a whole career but it's it's been amazing and it's the holidays it's a time we remember a lot of things for for me the the journey into security started with my mom <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that story. I, I also love to share a couple of interesting facts about my guests. So one is you've been to every RSA conference since what did what'd you say, like 98 or something like that? Since about 98. I was lucky enough to go to one of the t- first five while I was still at NSA. I was doing a lot of work in commercial security, commercial cryptography work for the agency. Got out to RSA early. When I left and joined uh, the bank, I I made it a point of wanting to stay involved. And just after Y2K, I actually reached out and started talking to the folks at RSA and got involved in the program committee there. And so I've been in the program committee and the conference committee at RSA for a long time and have found it really rewarding because the conference there, and a lot of us have been, it's it's a big conference and it's really like four conferences in one, right? There's right. some amazing sessions. If you can find the time to get away from everything else to go to actually attend the sessions. And then there's, you know, the huge vendor floor. We all know what's going on there. It's a huge opportunity as a networking. There's people that are great friends that I see once a year. I've got a a Wednesday breakfast meeting that I have a couple of friends at, and we do it every single year. It's our one chance in the year to catch up. Wow. Um, And then, of course, it's huge networking, right? You can't walk around without bumping into people you know or people you want to know. You know, you can go up. The speakers are very approachable. You can go find people after a talk. And so I've been involved for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. And then the one other little interesting fact about you I picked up, you love to go go-karting. Yes. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know, awesome. Do you do it competitively or just for fun? Have you have you like won races? Uh, we have like a, a gentleman's group that, I, that I'm involved <laughs> in, right? Because, you know, go-karting is very much a sport, right? It's the entree for Formula One and IndyCar and almost all of the big race series. But, you know, at at my age, being kind of a big guy, I'm not going to compete with a five foot six, (laughs) uh, you know, 18 year old uh, running around there. But I'm part of a gentleman's league. We get together once a month, uh, we race. And for me, the go-karting is a chance to be really, really competitive in an environment where I'm not going to, you know, have any serious accidents. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, gentlemen, go karting. For some reason, I have visions of you guys all putting on smoking jackets and uh, and trailer home <laughs> pipes <laughs> while you're, you're go karting. But uh, I'm sure you're wearing the proper safety gear. Yeah, safety gear is important, and um, and just a lot of fun. And and it's it's fun because we actually draw random teams for every race. So we're getting in and out of the cart as part of the timed race, um, running a timed race. It, it's just a blast. And it's it's an affordable way for me to go racing. I, I'd love to be, you know, taking a Ferrari to the track, but, you know, security hasn't been that uh, that kind of a job where you get to buy a Ferrari most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in, in many cases, I'm sure the go-kart is far more fun. It's much more fun to drive a slow car fast than a fast car slow, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, like I said, it, it's the beginning of so many professional racing careers. It is, yeah. Because it forces you to learn how to manage in a very constrained environment. And, and that's really one of the hallmarks of security today is that you're managing in a much more constrained environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was talking to a couple of people last week. It's been interesting over the last year and looking forward with the overall economic environment, we're seeing more CFOs get involved in in security and they're asking 
they're asking the question CFOs ask, right? Well, do we really need redundant layers of firewalls? Can, <laughs> can you give me better security at a lower price? Can I get how can I optimize a, a tool stack? How can I optimize processes? These are great questions from the board and the CFO. And a lot of times we've been, you know, historically we've been kind of adding on things. It's like, I need a firewall and I need a WAF and I need a, a, a proxy and I need a blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the tool vendors are great at bringing us new things. I like to ask vendors, like, what can I get rid of? Like, can ah. I put my, well, my new EDR tool, let me stop buying antivirus, right? Should, right. It's, that one's kind of obvious, <laughs> but, but all these new things don't take away from the vulnerabilities that we've been seeing for years. And so I want things that are giving me a, a multiple stranded, a multidimensional advantage in cybersecurity. And I'm looking at how do I find the right security tools for a particular company of a particular size at a particular stage. And, and one of the hardest things a lot of organizations have is they may be getting asked these questions, but they may not have an actual dedicated security person, whether it's a director of security, a CISO, or whatever, to actually analyze that and make decisions. And that's where we're starting to see this rise of a concept of a fractional CISO. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that and, and how that's kind of a growing space in InfoSec. So when I was doing consulting a, a few years ago, the big, big four-ish type of firm, mm -hmm. what I noticed was that, you know, much like the revenue of Fortune 1000 companies varies greatly from Fortune 5 to Fortune 950 the size of the security team varied significantly as well. And, and what you see is that around Fortune 350 or so, the size of the team starts to become a handful of people. And it, it continues like that all the way out. It's If you're fortunate, it's a big handful. If you're less fortunate, it's a small handful. And as you get outside the Fortune 1000, as you get to non-public companies that have fewer requirements, right. what you see is that there's relatively small t security teams, fewer dedicated people, and, and it's more of an IT compliance function, uh. and less of a support for the business. And what what we've started to see and what I'm trying to, to really drive home is that CEOs, CFOs, CIOs really need somebody who can think about the strategic risk that a company faces because of its IT infrastructure and its IT dependencies and, and then translate that to cybersecurity requirements and translate those cybersecurity requirements back into business terms mm. because too much of the time, people are still thinking in, in terms of the, the bad guys are the 14-year-old kid in a basement in New Jersey, to, <laughs> to paraphrase somebody. Right. And <laughs> yes, there are still some 14-year-old hackers and some that are very, very good and, and probably doing, I'll say, well for themselves, um, <laughs> right. either financially or just intellectually in the challenge of it. But more and more, this is really professional, right? And we started to see this with the Carter markets in the mid 2000s. And right. it's continued to evolve to where ransomware today is a full stack, vertically integrated service business that has customer service and payment management and hiring and firing and all of these things. Companies need to understand that cybersecurity environment and a fractional CISO can give them that visibility and help them understand what today's cybersecurity environment looks like. And then how do you prioritize things like the immutable backups we were talking about earlier for resiliency so that your organization's prepared and ready for a ransomware event instead of reacting to a ransomware event? So for companies that aren't even sure if they're ready for a fractional CISO, what what advice would you give? I mean, how do you how do you know you're at the inflection point where you're like, we need to take this further? The the key inflection point is: Are we talking about buying security technologies, or mm. are we talking about managing business risk? And if you're not talking about managing business risk, 
Mm -hmm. then you need to be talking to a fractional CISO or a full full time CISO to really be thinking about strategic business risk and how you manage the business in today's cybersecurity environment and cyber really today's cyber threat environment. Gotcha. Now I'm sure at this point there's no certificate you can get to be a fractional CISO. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what would uh, what would folks look for in trying to find a fractional CISO that fits their needs? You said something really important there, and that is fits their needs. So I want to come back to that. Sure. But I think the first thing you're looking for in a in a fractional CISO is a broad experience, somebody that's been in a couple of different industries. So they've seen security from some different perspectives, somebody that's been in it for several years, five years is is not enough to really understand this. You're looking for 10, 12, 15 years or more experience so that they really understand the industry because they need to be not only thinking about the technical aspects of cybersecurity, but they need to be thinking about business, business risk, and how that business makes money and how somebody might attack the business to prevent them from making money. The wipers is a a really good example where a lot of people wouldn't be thinking about what happens if all my computers get erased, but if all my computers stop working, I've got a real business issue. And right. I need to be thinking about that, especially in today's constrained supply chain environment. But going back, I think you said something really critical, which is what do organizations need in a CISO? And this is an area I find fascinating. We all know what a CFO does. We've had CFOs for 100 years, 500 years. I, I like to joke that we've had CFOs since the days of the Persians writing in cuneiform on clay <laughs> tablets to keep track of bushels of wheat. Right. It, it's well documented in, in you know the Bible and other historical documents. We've been tracking numbers and, and tracking our business by numbers for years. The first CISO is is generally considered to to be about 25 years ago with, I'm going to forget his first name, Katz at at Citibank, right? Yep. And so we've had 25 years of CISO. So you talk to a CEO and they're lucky if they've heard of a CISO in many cases, right? It's not (laughs) like there's classes in, in MBA school to tell you what a CISO should do. Right. And so organizations need to be thinking they're going to try that first CISO and get a feeling for what are their security needs? What are they looking for from that CISO? And they should be looking for management of a program. They should be looking for some metrics and some reporting on the status of the program. And they should really be looking for indications and understanding of business risk expressing cyber concerns as business risk so that the business leaders can make decisions about that risk. There's a lot more, but you see it in the growth of product CISOs, field CISOs, OT CISOs, right? All the different things that we see today with different kinds of CISO requirements are because we don't really fully understand what a CISO should be. And so we project a lot into it, as a CISO, I bring a lot of views to it, but every organization is going to go through a series of CISOs as they grow to understand what right. a particular business and the personalities involved, the executive leadership needs from a CISO. Sure. Now, we've seen a lot of fluctuation in the economy of late. Do you think that the economy fluctuations that we've seen have actually impacted whether or not you need a fractional CISO and whether or not people are moving faster or slower towards making that decision? I've seen it to be relatively stable in terms of demand. So I think the realization, because of a couple of factors, the realization that you need a strategic CISO perspective, a strategic security perspective on business really isn't getting reduced by the economy. It's really getting pushed by requirements from the SEC, looking at publicly traded companies, from the consistent news of ransomware, 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 which (laughs) 
It's a long-term trend. And, and then the other kinds of things that we see, the threats that we talked about in the news today aren't all or in somewhere, but they're all bubbling up in different ways to the executive leaders who are seeing news stories, who are hearing, hey, we needed to make an emergency patch. Hey, we needed to do something else. And that all pulls them to saying, well, am I asking the right questions about security? Do I, am I getting the right information about security? And am I buying not only the right tools, but the right program? Mm. The good thing about executives is that they think in programs and process and people, whereas a lot of us as security people have grown up buying tools <laughs> and we can talk about silver bullets all day long, but we really need a program that integrates process, people, and managing that risk from a business lens. And that's the big difference. And, and that's the kind of thing that you would be looking for from a fractional CISO, someone who can help you make the kind of the business program and plan and everything else that the board will actually understand. And that translating it to the board, translating the terms to business risk, and acting as that kind of translator between the board and the executives and the IT team is really the biggest, best role that a CISO, whether they're fractional or full-time, fulfills. It's translating, hey, we need investment, we need resources, we need process, we need tools, we need governance, all of those needs into things that the board understands why they're putting money into things and that the IT team knows what they're doing and what needs to be done so that the organization is managing risk. Because I think one of us already kind of said this earlier today, you can't be secure, but I can be resilient. I can be, re I can be proactive in planning for what we all know now is the inevitable event. Right on. Now you get to see as a, a fractional CISO, quite a few uh, organizations. So most companies kind of think that they're unique <laughs> in their problems, but that usually, right, that usually ends up not being true. So what, what do you see is uh, one of the most common problems over and over again, as you first engage a client that listeners might want to try and focus on first? I think for a lot of organizations, it's really understanding what they're trying to protect. Mm. Um, there's a, an easy tendency in IT to treat everything like it has to be protected the same way, but sure. the cafeteria menu um, is not the same as the secret recipe for my new drug or the code that makes my product unique, right? And right. so understanding what you're trying to protect, how you're trying to protect it really becomes kind of the the first big thing that hurdle that you have to face is what am I trying to protect and am I, what do I already have in place and what are my gaps? What am I, what am I missing and not thinking about? And, and I like to, I like to use the NIST cybersecurity framework as a way to talk about security to the executives, right? Identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. I, I can explain that to anybody. What becomes important then is to prioritize those things. And the Center for Information Internet Security has done some interesting work in saying you should prioritize this, that, and the other thing. I've really reduced it to about seven things. And, oh, wow. and it starts with MFA, right? We talked about uh, yeah. MFA earlier, but you know, too many people have five character passwords or you know, minimum whatever. <laughs> And if you can just get people to MFA, you've got done a huge job at starting to keep out the bad guys. Some phishing awareness goes a long way. And then I really, really focus on blocking and tackling. A lot of organizations have, have are not really running a vulnerability management program. They're not really thinking about configuration management, system hardening. It's kind of like, oh, I, I'm buying it from from one of the cloud providers. So it's secure. And it's like, well, no, there's a shared responsibility <laughs> model that says you have to configure it. So that basic blocking and tackling. And then 
look, you've got to have some detection and response. You've got to be looking at the logs, right? right. Uh, it, it does no good to have everything locked down, but then to you know find out after an event two months later that somebody logged in in January as an administrator and you didn't notice it until after the ransomware ran through, copied all your data and encrypted mm-hmm. everything. So you've got to have that active kind of uh, analysis to do detection and response. And then you build some basic program, right? Set some policies and do some other things. But it's those key priorities. It's amazing how many organizations are still, oh, yeah, we started deploying MFA, but it isn't everywhere yet. Or uh, yeah. we have no vulnerability management. Or, and I see this a lot in the smaller organizations, the mid sized organizations that I work with. We don't have a full detection and response capability. We bought the protection tools but we're not really monitoring the alerts and monitoring the logs and looking for people logging in in unusual ways. One of my favorite alerts is the one that says, Todd just logged in from one country and then um, you know, 10 minutes later, he logged in from a completely different country. Right. <laughs> very simple role, very easy detection, but critical to uh, alerting and knowing what's going on in, in your systems. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and so for that kind of thing, anybody in, in a lot of organizations that might be coming new for fractional CISO may also need to look at third parties to do the kind of exercises you're talking about. Do you actually help them evaluate some like managed security service providers or other services as part of what yeah. a fractional CISO might offer? Oh, yeah. We provide a full set of services. So it, and we really focus on this, that CISO layer, the translation layer. Yep. But then I've got partners that I can pull into an organization. I will mm-hmm. work with the IT team inside the organization to identify vendors that they're already using. Yep. You may already have a great set of network engineers that you use as an outsource provider great, let's just make sure they're doing the right security things in that network engineering, that they're not just focused on making sure the traffic gets from point A to point B, right. but that they're putting in some, some subnets to isolate traffic, put in some blockage between east, west, and north, south, <laughs> right. so that you don't have a globally flat network <laughs> trying to protect critical information. That's fantastic. And, 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 and that's the kind of advice people really need to hear. Uh, so I'm glad you were able to come on the show. I hope we can get you to come on again. I, I think we could probably pick your brain for another <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> um, but this has been great. Thank you so much, Todd. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's, it's been really great to be on the show today. And I look forward to uh, joining you again sometime. That would be fantastic. And with that, everybody, this has been The Threat Show. Thanks, Darian, for burning down the threats for us. Thank you, Todd, for coming in to give some fantastic advice for folks that may not have access to this kind of advice. And we'll see you all again in two weeks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning into The Threat Show. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe to us on YouTube. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and interact with us on Twitter at The Threat Show. Also, be sure to subscribe to Fletch's interactive newsletter and Trending Threats app to go deeper into the stories we discuss. Be sure to stay tuned to stay ahead of threats.